Welcome to Introduction to JavaScript for Apex Developers. This is Module 2, Adding JavaScript to Apex Apps. In this module, I'll cover four different ways that you can add JavaScript to your Apex applications. I'll start with Dynamic Actions and then talk about Dynamic Actions with JavaScript hooks. Then I'll get into Page and Component Level Attributes. And finally, I'll show you how you can use Static Files. The first and easiest way to add JavaScript to an Apex application is not to do it at all, and that's what Dynamic Actions are all about. Dynamic Actions are a declarative framework within Apex that allow you to configure attributes to specify what you'd like to have happen and when. Apex will generate the JavaScript code for you and add it to the page for execution. You can think of Dynamic Actions as two parts. The Dynamic Action, which is the parent, is where you specify the event and a related component such as the click of a button or the change of an item's value. The actions can be thought of as the children, and that's where you specify the response to the event. Perhaps you'll hide or show an item or region on the page. Here's how I like to think through dynamic actions. Of course, you have the event, and that leads to some kind of an action. Sometimes one action won't be enough, so you have the ability to add as many actions as are needed. The top part there, that's the parent, the dynamic action. And of course, the actions are the children. Within the dynamic action, you can specify an optional client-side condition that will resolve to true or false, allowing you to specify actions that only fire accordingly. And of course, like before, sometimes one action isn't enough, so you can specify as many actions as are needed in either path. It's worth pointing out that although you'll specify the primary event, such as click or change at the parent level, there's another event that's very important for many actions, and that's the page load event. So within actions, you'll find a setting, fire on initialization, that allows you to specify whether or not the action should fire at that time as well. Generally speaking, this setting will default correctly, but you may need to adjust it from time to time. Let's work through an example. This is the customer details form in the sample database application. Imagine you got a requirement that said, you needed to disable the alternate number field, which is here, until the phone number field here is populated. Here are a few questions you could ask. First of all, what's the driver? Well, you have two candidates. It's probably either phone number or alternate number. And in this case, it's the value of phone number that's driving what happens elsewhere on the page. And if we think about the event we might want to associate with that, we'd probably choose the change event. Is there a condition? Yes, and you could say it either way. Either when phone number is null or phone number is not null. In either case, you're just flipping your true and false actions. What are those true and false actions? Well, if phone number is null, then we want to disable the alternate number field. And if phone number has a value, then we want to enable alternate number. Is page load relevant? Yes, because when the page loads, we need to enable or disable the alternate number field, even if the phone number has not yet been changed. So it ends up looking like this. When the phone number changes and the value of that field is null, then we'll go ahead and disable the alternate phone number field, and page load is relevant. If the value is not null, then we will enable the alternate phone number field, and of course that's relevant at page load as well. Let's work through one more example, and then I'll show you how to implement it in Apex. In this case, the requirement is to hide list price and product image if product available is no. So here's product available, and its value is going to determine what happens with list price and product image, but we also have a product image region down here. So here are those questions again. What's the driver? Well, in this case, it's obviously product available, and we would say the change event of this item. Is there a condition? Yes, in this case we'll go with product available is equal to no. And what are the true or false actions? Well, if the value is no, then we're going to hide the two items here as well as the region. And if it's not no, then we'll go ahead and show the items in the region. And yes, page load is relevant because we need to hide or show the items in region even before the value of product available changes. So it ends up looking like this. When product available changes and its value is no, 
Then first we'll hide the item's price and image, and then we'll hide the region. The reason that we needed two actions is because sometimes an action can only work with items or a region. So we needed two hides in this case. And of course we'll do the opposite if the value is not null. Okay, here I am logged into my Apex workspace in the Oracle Cloud free tier. And what I'm gonna do is implement the dynamic action we just worked through, example two. To start, I'll go to the app gallery and locate the sample database application. And then I'll go ahead and install this application. Okay, through the magic of time-lapse, my app is installed. And I can go ahead then to the app builder, where I can drill down into it, and then I can run it. So that'll open up the front end and another tab. I'll go ahead and get logged in. And if you remember, Example two is on the products pages. So here we have products and if I drill into a product like the bag, it'll open up the product details page. And if you remember, the goal here was when product available is set to no, we want to hide list price, product image, and then the product image region as well. So what I'll do is use the developer toolbar to go edit this pop-up page, that's page six. And you could come here to the Dynamic Actions tab, right click and create a dynamic action from scratch, but it's generally better if you come to the driver, in this case, Product Avail. If we right click here and create a dynamic action, some of the choices will default for us. It's a little bit easier that way. So here in the when, the event defaulted to change, which is perfect, that's what I wanted. But I wanna take a moment just to show you all of the different events you have to choose from. Browser events, framework events, component events. These are specific to Apex and some more. We'll take a look at those in the next module. The selection type went to items and items is P6 product avail. All that's good. I do need a client side condition. And we said if an item equals value, you'll see there's all kinds of different conditions you can set. So it said the item name is P6 product avail, which is correct. And the value I'm looking for is N. So the display values are yes and no, but the return values are Y and N. So we're saying if the item product avail is equal to N, then what we want to do when we come down to the actions now, the children, and we're in the true branch. So if it's N, then we want to hide something. Now it defaulted to show for the action. So I'll just swap that out to hide. But again, just look at all the different types of actions you have available to you in the dynamic action framework. There's quite a few to choose from. But we'll go with hide. And I want to hide items. And notice that this is plural. So I can choose multiple items. We want to hide list price and product image. But what I can't do with the same action is hide the region. So I will have to create another action for that. But before I do, I just want to show you the setting here. This is that fire on initialization setting I was telling you about, which you can toggle as needed. So what I'll do is right click on hide here and hit duplicate. And then I will choose region for the second one and select that product image region. Now because hide has an equal opposite show, and that's also the case with enable and disable, I can right click on the first one and select create opposite action and it'll create the show automatically having selected the, the items that I had in the previous one. So I'll do the same for the region, create the opposite action. So now I have two hides and two shows and we should give the dynamic action a better name. And I typically name these based on the, the when here, because if you have a lot of actions, it becomes very difficult to think of a name that encapsulates all of them. So I'll just say P6 product avail changed. So we'll save that. We'll go back here and open this page again. 
And now when I hit no, you can see the items are hidden and the region as well. And if I save that and then come back into bag, notice how the items and the region are hidden by default as well. And that's because of that setting fire on initialization. All right. Hopefully at this point you have a good understanding of how dynamic actions work in Apex. Okay, that's it for the demo in this module. From here on out, I'll just talk you through the concepts, starting here with dynamic actions with JavaScript hooks. The creators of the dynamic action framework knew that a declarative system could never encapsulate everything one could do with JavaScript code. So they provided various hooks to extend the capabilities of the framework, provided folks knew how to leverage them. For me, this is probably the sweet spot for most Apex developers. Once you know how to create dynamic actions using a little bit of JavaScript here and there, you'll probably be able to deliver on the majority of the requirements you're given. This is the first of three different places where you'll find these JavaScript hooks. This is the event and selection type. We're at the parent level of the dynamic action and looking in the when area. So here's event. A moment ago, I showed you all the different events you can choose from in this dropdown. But of course, not every event is in the list. So if you want to work with a different event, you can just select custom. And when you do, you'll see this item appear custom event, and you can just type the name of the event that you want to work with in here. You can actually type a comma separated list of event names. If you want to work with multiple events, using a single dynamic action. Below that, you see selection type, and this is usually what you would use to choose something like a region, item, or button, something declarative. But if you want to work, say, with, I don't know, multiple regions, provided you know how to write a jQuery selector, you can choose that option, and then you just type it in down here. We'll talk more about jQuery selectors in the next module. The next place you'll see these JavaScript hooks is the client side condition. So we're still in the parent part of the dynamic action, but we've moved down to client side condition. A moment ago, again, I showed you all the options you would see in that dropdown. All of them have to do with the value of a single item. That's fine if that's the case. And that was the case for us. We just needed to check to see if the product available was equal to N. But what if you need to check the value of multiple items or do something besides checking the value of an item? Well, there is this option here, JavaScript expression. Once you select that, you'll have a place where you can type in an expression. Of course, it needs to evaluate to true or false. But here you have complete access to the DOM, the web page. So you can really do whatever you need to do here. Moving down to the action level, here, of course, we saw a moment ago that there are all kinds of actions you can choose from in the dynamic action framework, hide, show, enable, disable, and even refresh, which is declarative Ajax. But you're not going to find every single thing that you might need to do in a web page or given a certain requirement. So in those cases, you can set the action type to execute JavaScript code. And then you'll see a place where you can type any JavaScript code you want, provided you know how to do so. So those are the three areas where you'll find these JavaScript hooks. And once you learn how to use them, the dynamic action framework becomes a lot more powerful than it is without them. Okay, let's move to page and component level attributes. Starting first with the page level attributes. You may find at times that the dynamic action framework is not perfect for every situation. You may have many, many dynamic actions on a page and find that the dynamic actions to action structure is a little rigid and feel that handwritten JavaScript code would just be a better solution. And that's perfectly valid. In the past, you may have used page level attributes that gave you access to the web page so you could add custom JavaScript tags and code. But these days we have specific page level attributes that are dedicated to JavaScript code. So that's where you're going to want to put your code these days because that's where other developers will look for custom JavaScript code. 
To use the page level attributes for JavaScript in Apex, you'll first need to navigate to the page attributes, and you can do that by selecting the uppermost node in the tree under the rendering tab, and then you'll see those page level attributes on the right. And if you scroll down, eventually you'll come to this section for JavaScript. And there are two items here that you can use to add JavaScript code directly to the Apex web page. The first is function and global variable declaration. Code you add here will be executed in the global scope, and it's executed very early on, before the DOM load finishes and before the Apex components are initialized. Below that, you'll see execute when page loads, and the timing here in the scope is a little bit different. Here, you'll be in a function scope, so if you declare any functions or variables, they will not leak out to the global scope. And this code will be executed when the DOM is ready and all of the Apex components have been initialized. These two attributes allow you to do pretty much anything you might need to do in an Apex web page. Moving on now to component level attributes, over time various components such as regions and items with an Apex have been given a JavaScript initialization code attribute. As far as regions goes, that includes the interactive grid, and that's both at the region level as well as the column level. And you'll also see that for charts, calendars, and trees. And then items such as the HTML editor, markdown editor, and pop-up LOV have this attribute as well. And the idea with this attribute is that it will allow you to customize the component beyond the types of things you'll see in the declarative UI. Here's an example from the interactive grid. So I'm looking at the region attributes here. I've scrolled down. Eventually I find JavaScript initialization code. If you click in this field and then go to the help tab, you'll be given a function which you can use as a starter function. So the idea is you just copy and paste this in here. And when the function's invoked, you'll be given an options object, which will have some defaults. And then you in the body of the function can customize the options object as needed, and then you just return it back out. And this is the options object that will then be used to initialize the component. To see a full list of the attributes that you can use to customize the component, just go to the JavaScript API documentation for Apex. Okay, moving into the home stretch here, let's talk about static files. Static files do have several advantages over the page level attributes you saw a moment ago. Faster page loads could be one of them. If you're adding a lot of JavaScript code to the page level attributes, that code must be transferred from the server to the browser every single time the page loads. However, if you move that code to a file and then just link to it, you can take advantage of browser caching so you only have to send the file once. You could even optionally minify that file so you send less data across the wire that first time. Of course, you'd have to have a lot of JavaScript code before you start to see any of those advantages. Perhaps a better reason to move to static files has to do with sharing code between pages. Using the page level attributes, if you wanted to use some code on different pages, you'd have to copy and paste the code across and then maintain it in those separate locations. If you move that code to a static file and link to it, then of course you only have to maintain it in a single place. If you decide to use static files, you'll have to choose exactly where you want to put those files. You have several options. Perhaps the most performant is to introduce a reverse proxy server that sits between the browsers and your Apex web listener, which is typically ORDS. While that may be the most performant, it's probably overkill for most Apex developers. The most convenient option, on the other hand, is to simply leverage the static application and workspace files in your shared components. Here's an overview of how you can leverage the static application files. The first thing you need to do is find the code, which will likely be in your function and global variable declaration attribute at the page level. Just remove it from there and then put it into a file and save the file and give it a name. Then navigate in Apex to your application's shared components, static application files, and click the upload file button. Once you've uploaded the file, you'll see a new row in the report below, 
and you can just copy the value from the reference column and paste that into the page level attribute file URLs. While this will not leverage the minification I mentioned before, it will take advantage of browser caching, which is probably going to be good enough in most cases. Of course, if you want to share that file across multiple pages, all you have to do is paste this URL in any page where you'd like to use the file. If you'd like to share the file throughout the entire application, or at least all of the pages within an application using a particular user interface, you can go to your user interfaces, drill down into your user interface details. Typically that's going to be the desktop UI. And then just paste the same URL here under JavaScript where it says file URLs. Well, that's everything I wanted to cover in terms of adding JavaScript to an Apex app. If you'd like to learn more, you can turn to the JavaScript API documentation and read the section titled Adding JavaScript to an Application Express Application. Let's turn now and take a look at what you'll be doing on the hands-on lab for this module. Once again, I'm going to navigate to bit.ly slash js for Apex. That'll redirect me to the hands-on labs for this workshop. And once here, before going to the module 2 lab, if you've not yet created your Application Express workspace, you'll want to stay here on the lab overview and setup page and just work through the parts below. You'll go ahead and create your Oracle Cloud Trial account, create an autonomous transaction processing database within it, and then you can create your Apex workspace and then move on to module 2. The parts in this module reflect the parts in the presentation. You'll start by creating a dynamic action that basically does exactly what you saw me do already. It will hide and show some things in the sample database application according to the value of another item in the page. Then in part two, you're going to start leveraging the JavaScript hooks within dynamic actions, and you'll end up basically recreating the same dynamic action here, but using less of the declarative attributes and more of the JavaScript hooks. Ultimately, the dynamic action will work the same, but hopefully you'll start to see how powerful the dynamic action hooks can be when needed. In part three, you'll get into using page and component level attributes. And then in part four, you'll move the code that you created in part three to a static file and learn how to reference it there. Go ahead and start working through these parts. And when you've finished, move on to the presentation for module three.